give and take of Don Brigham and the others here, and I wanted to come by and see if you've got everything solved for the year. 1986, I think, we've called it a year for opportunity. And I think it is. It's a challenge for all of us, both legislatively and politically. But I'm convinced that by working together, we can show the American people that their elected Republican office holders continue to, to provide and produce positive results. Next week, I'll send you my budget for fiscal year 87, which will meet the requirements of Graham Rudman without raising taxes or threatening our national defense. I also want you to know that I do want a reconciliation bill. However, last year's bill was unacceptable because of many provisions which increased spending or made ill-advised policy changes. I'm hopeful that we can work with all of you and the Congress to produce a reconciliation bill which <coughs> confines itself to producing significant necessary budget savings. On tax reform, let me reiterate that I would not sign the bill which passed the House. However, you've helped to keep the process alive, which I deeply appreciate, and I can assure you that we shall work closely with the Senate to obtain a bill which achieves real tax reform. On the foreign policy front, we have a number of vital issues, aid to freedom fighters in Nicaragua, Angola, and elsewhere, defensive arms for moderate Arab states, isolating Gaddafi, and of course, issues related to the forthcoming summit with Mr. Gorbachev. I imagine you've already covered some of these items this morning, and I really want to hear on your mind so I'll stop before I start plowing ground. You've all been <coughs> over. Let's start the discussion. And Bob, would you like to lead off? Well, Mr. President, we've already uh, kind of given some preliminary remarks of the of, uh, recommendation of the administration. I won't burden you with that. But Del Latta was about to make whatever observations he made. I think we ought to just proceed as we've been going here. And I feel mm -hmm. we want to be acknowledged the next. And I think uh, Bill Prentzel. So why don't you sound off? Mr. President, I'm just sounding off that. Uh, Politically, Graham Rudman is going to be a tough act. When these cuts come up there, and we cannot lose sight of the fact that it was passed by the Congress of the United States overwhelmingly, and you're merely following through on that mandate when those cuts come up there. Because the word I get is accurate. Bob, you can probably attest to this. But, uh, that Tip O'Neill might take that budget and send it right up there for a vote. And, and uh, I think we've got to be uh, on the lookout for that. With, with these cuts in there. So we got to be prepared to support that and to throw it right back in their lap every time they mention Graham Rudman and these reductions, will you vote <coughs> You know, and the president and the Republicans are really following through on what the Congress mandated us to do. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I just may, may I just say one thing about this. No, that's our uh, I just want to say that I think if you really look at it, this is the first time in 50 years. For 50 years, our side has been mainly against the continued deficit spending. Here and there, there's been a single year in the 50 where we um, maybe balanced the budget very briefly. But if you stop to think about it, it is the first time there has been a plan. There's no way to balance the budget in one year. There's been a plan that says we start here and out here we have a balanced budget. And anybody that wants to break this process on the way is breaking a whole five-year plan and getting us back on the track of continued deficits. Well, Mr. President, first I'd like to compliment you on the speech you made Tuesday night. I, uh, Bob and I, a number of members have talked about it and the seven presidents we both served under. That was the finest speech I've ever heard in my life and it was right on target. And I think everybody here would agree it's just outstanding. <laughs> Mr. President, I've uh, heard recently that uh, one area that's under consideration is increasing foreign aid. Now, I want to compliment Don Regan for arranging this meeting so that we can talk about some of these things. But I think this is the time, if we're going to talk, to, and Cap a little earlier spoke about the distressing situation as far as the defense, uh, with a reduction of about 6% this year. I think it would do your whole uh, situation as far as the budget real uh, well if you could come out and say we're going to cut foreign aid six percent. Now I had an excellent meeting yesterday with the Republican members of the Foreign Affairs Committee with uh, your new National Security uh, Advisor 
And I recognize there's some very, very sensitive areas that you need additional money, particularly as it affects uh, the Central American area. <coughs> now, I just wonder why it can't be some re reprogramming. I, I'm not against uh, whatever figure you come up with as far as helping the Contras. I think it was nice to see Israel offering some money back. But how much better and how e much easier it would be for all of us in the House of Representatives if we could say we're cutting foreign aid, even if it's just a little. But don't increase it. I think it's going to be the hardest thing to sell if we're reducing domestic programs and trying to increase this uh, defense of uh, so it's what you need. I'm only speaking from a person who backs you 100% on these programs. But I really think it's going to be very, very hard to sell a budget and sell uh, an increase in foreign aid. Reprogram, do anything you have to do to give what you need on some of these sensitive areas, but don't increase it. Hell, Israel and some of the others can take a cut this year. <laughs> Foreign aid is not just a case of helping out, let's say, the economies of some countries. A large part of it is help in security, which is far more economical where our interests are concerned than if we had to provide that security. That would be far more expensive. So in that place, we're, we're kind of dictated to by the circumstances of what we're up against. Bill Frenzel, did you want to be recognized? Uh, Yes, thank you. Mr. President, I really wanted to direct a question to uh, Mr. Miller, so maybe it is inappropriate. All right. Ham Fish. <coughs> Mr. President, I'd like to uh, bring up the question of immigration reform. In uh, the winter of 1981, it was the first Captain Federal Task Force that you formed. It became a priority of this administration, and during the three Congresses of your presidency, the Senate has passed legislation that you approve of three times. The, uh, the last time the House passed in 1984, uh, the measure after 10 days in conference couldn't come to a resolution over a couple of, of issues. And one of them had to do with reimbursing the states for the cost of the utilization. Your own, your own state of California was particularly concerned about, about the burden of the public assistance that would be forthcoming from the utilization. Uh, the, um, the bill now in this Congress has passed the Senate once again overwhelmingly. And the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, the Committee of Primary Responsibility, Peter Redino, said early on, a year ago, that the price for his really putting the shoulder of the wheel and finally getting this issue resolved this year, this Congress, was a strong commitment, personal commitment by you, plus an early resolution of what will be the proper dollar figure for the, for the states. Uh, I have carried this message to uh, many, many of your subordinates in the White House and in the Justice Department. And uh, really for the last almost a year, there's been no, no such commitment and response. And um, I'm dedicated to immigration reform, but I do hear more and more that the question, well, does the White House really care about it as much? Uh, does the Justice Department care about it as much as, as uh, William French Smith? Uh, did when he, when he was there. And I just want to take this opportunity to, to um, pass this on to you directly this morning. Thank you. Well, I'm, I, when you started out, I thought you said that we were, you saw me, I had to turn my button up a little bit here. I thought you said <laughs> the immigration bill? Yes, sir. The, uh, ah, good. Because <laughs> then later there, I thought maybe you were on something else, and I was getting a little confused. Well, no, I, I do feel very strong. I think that our borders, have, we've lost control of them. And the first basic responsibility we have, and I believe in it, that maybe it's that you haven't heard me say anything because of the other things on the plate that we've been so busy talking about, taxes, Rand Rudman, and so forth. But uh, no, I'll be very frank about that. Feel free to speak out. And I'm sorry that uh, if anyone's gotten the wrong impression, I believe we must have immigration legislation to get control of our borders again. And I'll be preaching for it. Jerry Ellis. Yes, thank you. Mr. President, uh, last year it became very apparent that the Democrats were going to attempt to make uh, trade one of the major issues in the coming campaign. Uh, Don Regan mentioned very early on in his comments that the economic news that we'll be hearing evidences that trade imbalances continue to be difficult. I want to bring to your attention, Mr. President, the fact that Bob Michael and the leadership recognized that as a potential issue early 
the leader has introduced a bill, a Republican bill, that places this emphasis upon open markets, upon uh, the impact that our dollar can have upon trade circumstances. We're seeing some improvement there. A an effort to, to recognize that free markets will make the difference and barriers are not the answer. I would hope, Mr. President, in this area, that you'd instruct your people to get in the middle of this early, work with our leadership, way before the Democrats try to get the issue. It will be critical this year, and I think we're way ahead of it. My cousin wants to talk. Just to reassure you, Jerry, we have the first of what will be regular uh, legislative strategy sessions on trade, protectionism, and the like yesterday. <clears throat> had all the players there. Uh, had George Schultz, Jim Baker, Mac Baldwin, Clay Yaya, uh, and the like, so that the White House uh, and the departments will be in concert on this. Uh, we have made a firm resolve that we are going to be uh, very much against legislation that will set up trade barriers, but we will definitely be enforcing, and you'll soon be hearing about this, 301 and 201 cases. And we're going to pursue an awful lot more of those uh, in the near future. We'll be coming up with that. I hope you look at the Michael Bill carefully. It, oh, yeah. it helps you a lot. Yeah, it's very definitely. Could I just say one thing that you mentioned here when you said about the dollar? I just said to our people the other day, I think we ought to stop talking about reducing the value of the dollar. What we are interested in our opponents bringing their currency up to match the dollar closer. And it's their being so far behind in economic recovery that leaves us up there all alone. But uh, let's talk about keeping a valuable dollar, but let them come on up and match us. Just to comment on that, Mr. President, I think you're absolutely right. When we talk at home about reducing the value of the dollar, it's kind of like tearing up the American flag. You know, it's, it's just really a bad, bad issue to talk about reducing the value of the dollar. I'm glad to, uh, to hear you sort of talk about increasing their value to match ours. I can remember a few years ago when we didn't have a dollar at this level, some friends of mine were on a deep sea fishing trip down to Lower Baja, Mexico. They came back horrified. They'd gone into the village to do some souvenir buying, bring presents home for the family and so forth. And the Mexican shopkeepers refused to take their American money. <laughs> they didn't get over that. John McLeod from Columbus. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think this is a very important meeting uh, for unity of purpose, and uh, as the ranking member on the banking committee, uh, I'll have some other issues to talk about vis-a-vis uh, -vis the dimension case, uh, your council, uh, Regan, and uh, the problem with uh, fiscally, uh housing, as I mentioned yesterday, Jim Miller will take a pretty good hit in this uh, budget, and uh, I can handle that. That'll give me some heartburn, but. Uh, the uh, representatives from the Comptroller's Office and the FDIC <laughs> have said that there would be cuts in what are known as non-appropriated funds. I don't know if this is, a, I thought I should mention this meeting. Uh, funds which come from fees and assessments against those and that they'll have to make substantial cuts in their operation. Uh, the other point is, and this has come up uh, as far as foreign aid is concerned, and I agree with the all wrote bill. We have to make some cut in foreign aid, it seems to me. But uh, what about the uh, multilateral development banks? That's an issue that's uh, within the jurisdiction of our, of our banking committee. And uh, the thought has been that these are legally binding commitments that we've already made. Uh, do we make cuts there, or what's, uh, what's, what's the uh, party line as far as I'm concerned? Jim, do you know the exact figures? No, no. Well, I'll, let me answer the challenge this way. Uh, what we have done, uh, I don't think you'll see us asking for any new increases in the capitalization of these international banks until we get over our own uh, fiscal crisis here at home. Uh, what obligations that have been obligated from the past we will have in the budget, but no new funds for any new starts. And what we've been trying to tell, as you know from Jim Baker's statements and the like, is that the World Bank should reprogram itself, not look for new funds, but reprogram its existing funds and put those to better use. Mr. President, Lynn Martin earlier uh, made a comment that was directed pretty well at all of us. We looked around this room, for example, and she's the only woman. 
And uh, we tend sometimes in our discussions here uh, to forget that there's extra special dimensions of a woman's point of view. She addressed herself more particularly, I guess, to kind of some of the cuts that will take place that have an effect on minorities and women and all the rest. Lynn, maybe you know, not exactly maybe the way you said it to us, but yeah. you may want to <laughs> you may want to have the so that the president gets the full flavor of what we were talking about here, Mr. President, I think it's very important from time to time, you know, you got some hard liners around here that anything you say will just you know will do it. But we know in a practical sense up there on the floor in the house where we have to live every day and really get things done, that there's another dimension to that. And there are those who, for considerations back home or their own personal feelings for whatever reason, it, uh, it takes those views melded with those of us hard rocks to give you the good, the full flavor of what your legislative liaison people really have got to deal with in a practical way. So, Lynn. I never intend to speak to the Republican leader again, but <laughs> uh, Mr. President, you understand how stubborn people are from Northwestern Illinois, so I will go ahead. My point is this, uh, I, I guess I won't be insulted by not being called a hard rock. Um, I, I have been with you on all of your budget cuts in non-defense programs. My point, and I will repeat it, is this. In this room where the only minorities probably were the waiters, where there's only one woman, I believe that your administration suffers sometimes rightfully from the perception when you're making these non-defense cuts announced by rather wealthy looking white males that there is really no understanding of what those cuts will mean. Now I know you understand and I know your personal um, uh, feeling for everyone, and, I, and certainly your cousins and uh, Cap Weinbergers and, and Jim's. I'm just saying we've got to do better in that area. And in a budget where you're going to have a real growth in defense and perhaps foreign aid, and all the cuts are going to fall there, <clears throat> may I at least suggest psychologically there be more of an effort to look as if you care and more people around <clears throat> here that bring that dimension to your White House. Was that nicer than I was before? <laughs> 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 Mr. President, I agree with uh, what Bill Broomfield said. I, I think that if we took an increase in foreign aid to the floor, and I'm not sure our, our committee chairman would even do that, that we would get laughed right out of court. The, a lot of Republicans, even if you used all of your <clears throat> talents to do so, would not vote for that. And the Republicans would love, I think, to have you in the position of increasing foreign aid or cutting everything else. Democrats. The Democrats, right. Uh, that would be something. But I, I would hope that in doing the foreign aid, we keep in mind that if there are reductions, and I think that's what's going to happen, that we do it even. There are places like Pakistan where they tell us, that, you know, when, you, when we had a military dictatorship where you gave so much money, we expect to get at least as much. And now that we have a, what they call a democracy, certainly moving in that direction. And uh, they are very, very sensitive to this sorts of thing. I think we can get away with not increasing it as they're going to ask us. But we sure couldn't get away with increasing, for example, Israel and cutting them by an inordinate amount. I think another thing, too, with regard to a trade, Jerry is exactly right. That is an issue that's shaping up. <clears throat> I think we could do a better job, probably have to do it uh, quietly with our allies in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan have started to do it, by emphasizing how their failure to take appropriate steps to help us could result in hurting their security. I told you on Tuesday what I told you, some of the Koreans, namely that if they didn't handle this issue right, help us handle it right, they could end up with another Jimmy Carter who got their attention. And I, I think it's very important that we uh, do everything we can to get them to take some of the steps to defuse that issue because, as you know, the Democrats have set an override uh, on your textile veto for August, right in the middle of the campaign. Uh, if they should succeed, it would be, it might be just horribly uh, 
disruptive not only to us <coughs> internally, but with this tariff on our friendships around the world. <coughs> I, uh, and also, I just want to tell this is, believe me, all of those things are a bit interesting. <coughs> there are some difficult things where security, foreign assistance, uh, problems that have been raised. The other day, one of those problems, the person of maybe half a dozen little children was in my office. They were kids, I don't know whether any of you have seen them from Afghanistan. <coughs> they tots. They either had one leg gone or one arm gone and one had arms and legs, but it was horribly scarred, literally gargoyle, all from the Soviet bombings of <coughs> Afghanistan. But things like that that just prey on us. But Lynn, I just wanted to tell you because I know you know that I'm on your side of these things, but you know, we have among our military aides now the first officer of the Coast Guard that has ever been a presidential military aide. Also, the first woman, because that Coast Guard officer is a woman. <coughs> and the other day, I just, I love this. I was kind of teasing her about something that had to do with the meeting I'd had with an admiral. And she listened and then very quietly said, <coughs> Well, she said, Mr. President, you understand that the Coast Guard is the unit around which the Navy rallies. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Barton, have you got, you want to wrap it up? Uh, one of the things I'm particularly concerned about, I've just finished uh, office hours up in my district. Uh, I went to four counties. I saw on a one-to-one -one basis over 2,000 people. I'm going to start next uh, Friday and do it for another about nine days, and I'll probably see another 1,000 people. And uh, one of the things that uh, in upstate New York, I come from Rochester, and I got in early this morning and opened the mail, and I brought along with me a copy of a telegram, which has been sent to you. This is from the mayor of the city of Rochester, but it expresses one of the things that I've heard from many of the mayors county executives and so forth. It has to do with the budget cuts as it relates to the domestic programs. In our areas, we're losing a lot of jobs, and we are very much concerned about it. In Syracuse, for example, which is not in my district, but it's uh, my district is right around it. Uh, GE's just announced closing the plant, 450 jobs. The Bristol Myers is closed, and that's uh, several other hundred jobs. And, and Rochester, New York, Kodak uh, has laid off something in the vicinity of 700 people, Black and Decker uh, closed down, and, and there are a number of others in upstate New York. And, and this telegram, I think, uh, expresses some of the concern, and I might mention also in our area, I don't know whether it's true in others, but many of these uh, uh, municipalities are <coughs> unable to meet their insurance costs, their liabilities, <coughs> uh, municipal insurance costs, <coughs> have just gone out of uh, sight. But uh, this has to do with the federal UDAG program says, I'm urgently, this is a telegram addressed to you, but I got a copy of it. I'm, a, I'm urgently requesting your reconsideration of the decision to defer indefinitely the federal UDAG program, coming on top of the proposed elimination of revenue sharing and a rumored 15% deferral in FY86 community development funding. This announcement strikes at the heart of the efforts of the urban areas of our country, large and small to revitalize themselves and create sort of needed jobs. The city of Rochester has used the UDAG program to spur downtown renewal and industrial expansion. UDAG grants received to date have leveraged, leveraged over $220 million in private investment in the creation of over 1,800 jobs. Uh, that is an important program in our area, and I think in others. And one of the things I'd just like to ask is that there be consideration given to the problems that these cities and these uh, counties and local governments are having now. And some of these programs, like EDA, the, um, the problems that they have with regard to sewer, water, and this sort of thing, are very serious problems in the Northeast and Midwest area. And I would hope that there could be some consideration given so that we can revitalize and keep, uh, keep our industries in, in our area and keep these jobs that we're apparently losing. I know, but I think also that all of us have got to have a longer range look and recognize that some of this unemployment, and it's spotty, that you know, we can't go by the national average. The truth of the matter is, we have a higher percentage of people working than we've ever had in our history. 
And right now, the help wanted ads in the Sunday papers around the country have multiplied and are more than we've had in a number of years of employers asking. <coughs> Some of these closings we have to face are not because of the economy. They're simply because of our increasing high tech that is now making some jobs obsolete. And some, some areas are going to have to face the fact of maybe even replacing. I'd like to suggest along with this that, again, there's a thing up there before all of you call the enterprise zones that could be a very productive feature in this. A number of states are already trying it on their own and without the federal government doing it, in every instance it's successful. But our job training partnership act has been more successful than any federal job program that we've had so far. And here again, the use of that, I think, but it could mean, and I know that mayors don't want to be in the position of suggesting that people leave town, but part of this problem is going to be relocation, where industries just are no longer existing simply because technology has, has taken them out of, the, out of the competition or the need for that many employees. All of this, what I guess I'm trying to say boils down to that before we follow the old roads that we've taken in the past with regard to economic recessions and so forth, let's make sure that we're embarked on a path that is going to use the marketplace and not just displace it and that is going to <coughs> treat the problem on a permanent basis. And believe me, having looked for my first job in the Great Depression, I'm, I have an inbred sympathy for what is happening to these people that are being laid off. Mr. President, I thank you very yes, much for your time, time and thank Nancy for the breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday afternoon, I phoned all the families of the seven heroes. And without exception, before the conversation was over, every one of those grief stricken people said to me, But you must keep the program going. Thank <laughs> you.